take your company value to 300 million, we gon' show you how to do it. But we got the roadmap, the aspirations, we'll give you a game plan and strategies. Seize control of your company's destiny today by tuning in to Private Capital Mastery. Yeah. Let's start the show. Welcome back to the Private Capital Mastery Podcast. I'm Brian Franco, and thank you for joining another episode. We are excited to continue to produce relevant content for founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs seeking to grow, scale, and exit their respective businesses. I also want to thank our sponsor, Meritage Partners, for their continued support of the podcast. As some of you know, over the last 20 years, my focus has been centered on providing guidance in exit strategy planning, facilitating access to growth capital, and effectively executing large-scale exit strategies via the successful sale of our clients' businesses. By orchestrating the deployment of over $2 billion in capital during this time, I have gained valuable insight and perspective that I'm thrilled to share with you and through our podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by a friend, and guess, Russ Perry. Russ is the founder and CEO of Design Pickle, a game changer in the creative services industry. In 2015, Russ launched Design Pickle to address the challenges he encountered while seeking talented creatives. Since then, Design Pickle has redefined the subscription services model, becoming the largest subscription creative services company globally by revenue, clients, and creatives. Their custom application streamlines the creative process, offering graphic design, motion graphics, presentation design, video editing, and custom illustrations. With same or next day design output and spot on the Inc. 5000 list from 2019 to 2023. Design Pickle continues to lead the way. Russ and his diverse global team are dedicated to providing top quality design solutions for companies worldwide, making Design Pickle the number one choice for all your credit creative needs. In fact, Meritage Partners uses a design pickle and uh, very happy with the service. Welcome, Russ. How are you? We got here, Brian. I'm good, man. Thanks so much for that's a new it's a new way we're doing the bio and the write up. So you're the first person ever to to deliver that to the public. Awesome. Hopefully, hopefully we get it out there. But I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show today. Thanks for being on, being on the show. Thanks for being here with me, spending the time. And as you know, and as we talked about, the Private Capital Mastery Podcast is, is here you know, to provoke thought in founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs and help guide them through the life cycle of their business, right? From, from startup to growth and scale through all the way through that exit. And um, so I'd love to talk about your experiences and um, specifically with Design Pickle, and the amazing yeah. story, success story, I'll say that you've ex that you've had as a company. So, let's dive into it. I yeah. actually, I I yes. want to share right out of the gates a story, and I think okay. this is like important because I never really thought about capital. Like I didn't understand it. Like I didn't, I went to design school at a public university, so like that's just explains my level of financial sophistication. But um, we were bootstrapped from the day one, you know, providing services to companies. And we were always able to grow as much as we had access to profitability. And so, you know, that was a challenging thing. But there was this like ego part of me that I was like, I don't want to take on money. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I'll tell you the story of my very first access to private capital. Mm -hmm. And it was my buddy, Jake Knight, gave me like a shark loan for a trade <laughs> show we wanted to do. Now, the problem with trade show marketing is that typically you got to put a lot of cash up front for an event that could be months or a year away, and you get no ROI on that until the event. So I think this event at the time was the Infusionsoft conference in Phoenix, which is now, I think this company, they've rebranded called Keep, but it's like a marketing. And the amount at the time was to me like astronomical, but I think the reality was probably like $6,000 or something. Like it wasn't even, it wasn't even big. And I was like, I want to do this. I don't have the capital. I don't have the cash. And so he gave me a very uh, steep, but favorable, at least in my mind, loan to get the cash, pay him back within a year of the event. And needless to say, the event was a huge success. I paid him back like a couple months later, which he was kind of pissed because there was, <laughs> he just got paid interest on this outstanding. There was no prepayment penalty. So yeah. he only made a little bit and, 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 uh, 
that was also a good negotiation thing. If we go into tips on when you're, when you're looking at it, but it was the first time I realized, wow, I could use capital to accelerate outcomes and then do that in a way that helps drive my business. This, this happened to be non equity. It was just a loan, but they really got me thinking about how do I use capital in a way to, to, to grow the business, to accelerate the goals that we have um, and do that faster. And now to me was like that little trade show was like an unlocking moment for me as a business owner that not, you know, it's not about selling all the time. It's about how do we move things? How do we do things faster? And cash absolutely is key for that. Absolutely. And, and that story is, 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 I love that story because it really resonates with me. You, you had negotiated that perfectly. No, no prepayment penalty. <laughs> by accident, uh, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It yeah. worked. And um, yeah, I mean, $6,000 or whatever that amount was at that time. I mean, you know, it, it might as well have been a million dollars, right? Because, right. you know, I suspect that at, at that time you were developing the company, you know, you weren't thinking about, you know, uh, the private capital markets per se. And, you know, but I, I want to take, I want to back up a little bit because, you know, typically founders and entrepreneurs, it, it does take a lot to get to the place where you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm ready to look at this world. I'm ready to see how I could collapse time and accelerate mm -hmm. the growth of my business with outside capital. But did it take you long? Was there a lot of, was there a long pain cycle for you? Or did you just see the problem and identify the problem and say, nope, I need to bring in capital? You know, it took me longer than I think most, because again, I think a lot of it had to do with um, lack of education, right? Mm -hmm. Like not understanding this from a self-taught entrepreneur mind. And I did have a slight advantage with our business model. So Design Pickle, we, we help businesses and brands and marketers and anyone get access to daily design output. So you basically, it's like hiring a fractional creative. And... Um, and it's, it's cheaper than a full-time person. You know, our, our, our best plan is a thousand bucks a month, but what's really neat, unique about our business model is that a thousand dollars a month for say a software company is a pretty, it's a pretty large amount for license. Yes. And so we had this really cash flow favorable model. And also we were doing things like selling an annual plan that was paid up front. And so when we started to, when I started to like, after that trade show, I was like, you know, it would be really great to bring on some capital, but unique to my model is that I can cash flow pretty easily as we grow. So the more we grow, the more cash we're getting in the door. Mm -hmm. And if I do take on lending or I do take on other forms of capital, non-equity based, I could pay this back faster than most. And that's not the case if you're a company selling $25 monthly licenses, right? Like if you take on a $5,000 loan, it's going to take you a while to pay that back. For, but for us, that could be one client for five months or five clients for one month. So I think the first thing that I learned inside of this is like, is like one, it works. And that was that story I shared kind of accidentally. But two, I, I knew that I had a business model that could help support accessing capital in a healthy way. And I wasn't going to over leverage myself or give away the farm. And I don't think I'm, I don't think I thought about it that analytically initially. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's sort of over, it sort of revealed itself as we would tiptoe into different types of lending and different types of capital that we were actually able to, to use it quickly to grow. And then the more we grew, the more capital we had to then pay that back, refi, access, whatever else. Right. Um, but I don't think a lot of people think about it in, in the startup bootstrap world. Granted, if you're going down a venture, you know, traditional investor model of growing your business, that's where you start, right? Like you're just in the thick of it. But for, for people like myself and others who are kind of doing it on their own, I, I, I did have this like, like naivety. Like I was like, oh, that's for the, that's for Silicon Valley, right? Or that's for so-and-so. And then I stumbled into it and I was like, oh shit, this is actually really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Because yeah, the, re the reality is having a, a, a you know, MRR of $1,000 uh, per, per client, right? And I understand there's different price points. Right. That's impressive, right? Versus uh, software companies that are, you know, offering from 25 to 75 to $100 right. per month per seat. And, um, and we spend a lot of time, even companies that don't have the 
ability, I shouldn't say ability, but don't have in their model to to charge that reoccurring revenue component. I mean, we even see it in, gosh, mechanical HVAC, where you know, boots on the ground, mechanical HVAC companies are out there providing monthly service, maintenance service mm -hmm. as a, at a flat fee. But you and I both know when it comes down to valuation, that MRR or ARR is extremely valuable. And it's, in fact, it's more valuable than, you know, one-time revenue, right? Right. And so you do have that advantage and you work that advantage to, to benefit the growth of the company. And yeah. what, what's beautiful too is, you know, in mastering private capital, I mean, there's a range of challenges and issues, right? And, and you, you stumbled across the, you know, the initial investment and you did a great job there. Um, but, you know, some of these common pains and problems associated with uh, the pursuit can, can range from, you know, either, you know, limited access to understanding complex investment structures, you know, and then, you know, it could, it could put a, a CEO or a founder in the mindset of, oh gosh, like you just said, no, that's not for me. That's for big Silicon Valley companies. And so, I applaud you for that because it's it's um, it's a big step, you know. Both, <laughs> as you said, from from you know an ego standpoint, like no, I could do this myself. I could bootstrap this. To no, wait a minute. I mean, I could strategically collapse time, and right? Accelerate the growth of my company. And and I think for me, it was like one. There's more things that exist out there, and you're the expert. Like you, you know this, and you probably work with your clients intimately. There's you know, pr prior to 20, I'd say 2016, 2017, when we first started to test this, I thought the only sort of only form of capital was like VCs, right? Or like a, like an SBA loan. Yeah. There's so yeah. many other things. So yeah. one, that was a big learning lesson for me. And we can talk about what we did or other things, but the, also the thing that I learned through this process is that, you know, I've had a couple big wins when it's come, when it's come to bringing in outside capital. Mm -hmm. I've also had some some not so big wins, nothing traumatic, nothing dramatic, but I've spent some money on things that didn't work. And I think for me, when I look back at all of the things that we've done, leveraging capital, I always, when it worked and it worked in a really big way, I always knew exactly what the plan was for that cash. And when it kind of didn't work or was like, oh, we did this, but then we're sort of sitting on this asset. Like I've, I've used capital by companies, by domains, grow, invest or whatever. It's like when it was just sort of like opportunistic and like, hey, we should do this. And then we pulled in some capital to do it, but we didn't have a clear plan. That was always the stuff where I was like, what are we doing? You know, like this isn't, this doesn't make sense. So I think, I think over time, that's always been something I've refined is like, no one should even be talking about bringing in outside capital unless they know exactly how they're going to use it. And like yeah. by knowing, meaning like you have, have tested it already and you need more to accomplish this at a bigger way. <laughs> You're exactly right. And, and, you know, there's different stages of the growth and development of a company which requires different types of capital and different types of capital structures along the way, right? Um, you know, it, it, we just uh, recorded an episode earlier uh, this morning where we were talking about how, you know, early VC money is going to be structured mostly as equity where, you know, later stage companies can access debt in, in a more meaningful way because they have that cash flow and that debt service and that history. And, um, you know, you, you certainly have an amazing business model, continues to grow, but a uh, question for you, because I know viewers and listeners tuning in are going to want to know, but how did you navigate through the structuring of the investment that, that was made into your business? And, and, yeah. and, and, and then, um, but to, well, before you answer that, uh, part of that's always having a plan. And you, you clearly stated you had a plan. You know how to, right. what you're going to use that money for, what those proceeds were going to go to work on, and then how were you going to get out of that or repay that kind of uh, capital, right? Right. So... I'd love to hear you. Well, I, I never wanted to take an investor, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, we had used friends for lending. Uh, we had used, actually, you know, good friend of ours, Nick Long. His brother lent me some money once to buy a domain, which is a funny story. I'm the owner of pickle.com. <laughs> that was one of those things I don't have a plan for. I still don't. It just redirects to our website, but I do own pickle.com. Awesome. Um, but, but, but we had always, we, you know, we'd always basically been a profitable company. The only times we weren't profitable was by design when we wanted to grow faster. And that's when we started to leverage outside capital for that reason. We can run in the red, put a lot of money towards growth and, uh, and then get it back to black. And so 
we did revenue lending for through a group um, out of out of the Northwest. Okay. And then we were just like, look, we're just, you know, we hit COVID. It was a weird year. It's actually a good year for us. We're going into 2021. We're like, look, we're riding this wave. Let's just stick to the profitability, stay in the black, self-fund growth, maybe pull back on the growth lever a little bit. And um, I was introduced to our our now uh, investment partner, a group out of Austin, Texas, Colorado River Partners. And um, and and they were super excited about what we were doing. I said, no, I said, no, I said, no. Uh, and then the deal kept getting better. And what I realized was exactly what we talked about before. I was like, look, if I say no to this, yes, I, I, you know, I'm more control, a little less stress. I kind of could do my own thing. But if I say yes to this, we can collapse time and we can access resources. And actually, the one of the primary reasons I said yes to taking on an investor wasn't because of the cash, was because of the people that came along with it, the board members, the accountability, the strategic advice. And so that's something I don't know if you talk a lot about on the show, but often capital decisions should also be made with, well, who's behind the money? And do they add more value than the dollars themselves? And that was the, exactly the case that we had. Um, and so really at that point, it was for us to go big time. And we're on that path right now. We've had a lot of success. We've also faced a lot of challenges along the way, but it wasn't any different than the time I did revenue lending. It wasn't any different than a time I borrowed money from Jake. It was just like, look, I know what the plan is. I want to do this faster. I want to do this bigger. And so I'm going to use, I'm going to use capital as the fuel for that. Um, but it's been, it's also been a huge learning lesson, right? Because there is a, uh, a stewardship of money, whether it's a bank or a person or a fund or whatever, you know, unless you're selling it outright and your hands are clean and you have nothing to do with it anymore. If you're still operating, you're still part of that. And you're taking that. Um, I love the responsibility. I also know that I, 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 I view the company a lot differently too, because, Every decision I make is not for us, it's for the company. And that and that is fueled knowing that part of this is owned by other people and our employees have shares, some of them. And so um, but it's been great. And I think I think learning learning what I know, like learning what I know now in the process, I've been able to pay it pay it forward to other people going through this, kind of like what you're doing here on the show. Yeah, and to answer your question, as an investment banker, we we certainly you know realize and recognize the value of what we call smart capital, right? Mm -hmm. Smart capital is more than just capital. It's to to the point that you made. It was the the brain power that that capital came with, and the individuals on on, on your board or that came on your board through accessing that capital that was able to give you a collective brain power that you just didn't have before, right? And you have these different perspectives keeping you accountable to the vision, keeping you accountable and to to the growth of the business, but in a in a safe way to almost protect even you from yourself and 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 protect the company as it does grow, right? And so smart capital to us is always we're always looking for that equation one plus one equals something greater than three. And if it does, mm -hmm. the math adds up, right? I mean, right. well, the math doesn't add up, but it, it it makes sense, I should say. And so, but that's what we call it. And you that's exactly what you did. You access smart capital and they understood your vision. They understood where you were, where you, you know, where you are now and where you're going. And so applying the capital to that investment, you know, they, they certainly saw the way in and I'm sure they see a way out as this business grows and gets to a, additional scale over time. So I, I think that's beautiful that that you were able to you know come across this opportunity and you know and and sometimes part of negotiation is is saying no the first time and the totally. second time right and, <laughs> and uh, the third <laughs> and the third you know but ultimately it's uh, you know f from where I sit it's it's managing expectations because there's expectations on both sides of the table and we're working very hard and carefully to align those expectations so that everyone is is fulfilled in, in the investment, right? From an underwriting standpoint, an, ex, an expectation standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, it's amazing that uh, you were able to, you know, even from a $6,000 loan to revenue cycle financing, you know, to now this massive um, uh, equity investment. I assume it was an equity investment. It was, in yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was an SPV that they put together okay. for our, our deal. Yeah, that's, that's great. And um, so, when you think about, you know, your, your investor here today, you know, you, you talked about the value proposition that they brought to you, you know, mm -hmm. the board members, their experiences and those experiences, you know, they bring into your business. 
Um, how, how can you describe, you know, give us some examples. I mean, how is that capital that was invested in Design Pickle, how has that impacted the trajectory of your business to date? Well, look, we closed our deal in January, 2022. And if people can remember more than a year ago, March and April was a bit of a hard season for the markets. Crypto crash, uh, really the recession beginning, and who knows where we're at inside of that today. Uh, and then, and then, um, and then there's been a, a lot of headwinds ever since. So I think first and foremost, we got really, we were really fortunate to bring on XX Capital as the markets and and kind of everyone was headed into a season of uncertainty. We've been able to maintain our strategy. We've been able to maintain our 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 uh, you know keep our core team members that have been driving a lot of value, and that's not been the case for a lot of companies. Um, yes, we've had to reduce OPEX and yes, we've made some cuts and that's been challenging just to kind of really keep ahead of our cash burn. But generally speaking, you know, there's been a, 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 a safety net that we have had that we would have not had had we were just operating month to month based, you know, pulling in profits and, and uh, any deviation of that when you're self-funded is can be traumatic. It could be exciting one way, but if it goes the other way, all of a sudden you're looking at a big red number on your PL for in the next 30 days. And so for us, we're able to really plan out ahead. And I think from a guiding the company, you know, I'm CEO, my job primarily is to take and create a vision and make sure that vision gets executed with my teams. That vision can be bigger with access to capital because you don't have to be problem solving in the near term all the time. I could be problem solving for what are we going to do next year? What are we going to do in two years? What are we going to do in three years? Because my foundation is so strong. Mm -hmm. And then the question then becomes, well, you know, what's the vision? Execute the plan. And then asking ourselves, do we have enough resources, time, people, money to get there? Um, and so if the money one, not to say it's always solved, but if the money one is less of a pressure, then I can focus on the people, which gets me the time. Um, and that makes me a more effective leader than being the person who's saying, well, how are we going to make payroll next month? Because we just lost our largest client. Um, and look, I think I'm re we're really lucky and fortunate. I, I know that we, we've, we've not ever been, I've had businesses in the past where that was the exact conversation. We just lost our business biggest client. What the hell are we going to do next month to keep this thing afloat? Um, not just, you know, no surprise, those businesses didn't work out. Right. So I think capital, you really have to think about, you know, just kind of, kind of sum it all up is it's an insurance policy for your strategy. Okay. And if you want to have a big strategy, you want to execute things in a big way and make a big impact in this world. You need the capital, not just to do it, but to ensure that when tough storms hit, you can stay the course and you don't have to do anything dramatic or traumatic that can take you off the path of your strategy. Yeah, and if you think of capital as a tool, it's one of those tools that for, for you as a CEO that can you know reach out and, and, and utilize when, if and where needed and, and know exactly what you're gonna do with that capital when it's accessed. Exactly. It's, it's the, the possibilities are, are endless. I, I love your story. I love the fact that you know, you've been able to grow and develop your business with that capital injection. Um, and, and of course, even have the, uh, the, the excess uh, brain power, you know, on the, on the board, right. To help totally. you to drive and grow the business. And look in your, in your particular story, you, you know, um, some of these investors that you have worked with, you know, you, you, you stumbled upon them and it, it was, it was all part of your journey. But I have to tell you, like, in your journey, in, in the story that you just shared, it's 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 fun to me because, you know, even though it, forget the dollar amount on the initial loan, right? You, you were, you knew exactly what you would do with with the money when received. You knew you, you had the expectations of what you would and how you would perform at that at that trade show, which ultimately drove the growth of the business or contributed to that growth. So it always starts with plan and we always talk about plan, totally. having the right plan right so uh, i'm glad we spent the time here together and uh, lo love the love the fact that you were able to carve out the time in your busy day i know you got to run here soon yeah but, um, thank you for being here with me russ
Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for, for next year, probably the time that this gets live, I'm going to be sharing a lot more of the story. Uh, I've been a bit off social media. So if anyone wants to hear or connect and see more about this, you know, my journey and the journey of CEOs design pickle, you can go to my LinkedIn, just Russ Perry on LinkedIn. If you could figure out how to find it, I don't remember the exact domain. So. <laughs> well, what, what we'll do is, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely have access for for any listeners, viewers to to, to reach out to you. Awesome. And um, like Russ, you know, if you're in need of expert advisors to help guide you through this process as you're growing and developing your company, I also encourage you to reach out to us at info at meritage-partners.com. We hope you enjoy this informative episode of Private Capital Mastery. I'm your host, Brian Franco, and I look forward to spending more time with you next week. Until then, have a wonderful week.